All right, and it looks like we are live. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Daily Digital. Uh, today's date is Thursday, August the 18th. Um, and today's show would be just slightly a little bit different. Um, my ring camera decided to break on me, so the um, video quality of this video would not be as great without me kind of just holding this ring camera up um, with my hand the whole entire time. So much for technology, right? And without it, the quality just looks ridiculously horrible. So I'm going to just refrain from showing myself uh, for the majority of the video because nobody wants to see me anyway, right? Um, and then at the end of it, you know, so my hand doesn't get too tired, my arm doesn't get too tired out, I'll, I'll kind of jump back in for the conclusion portion of it. But uh, we have a wonderful show today, as always. Uh, we've got mind control wheelchairs we've got breath controlled nascar vehicles uh we've got apple's ar vr headset coming out here in the next like six months and then uh i think the last thing we have is how music actually affects the brain uh different types of music and stuff like that so uh without further ado i'm gonna give my hand a break and then we'll jump right into it All right, so here we are, guys. Uh, the first item up on the block here, we have a, I don't even call it a company, so it's just, it's called Milo, um, and it looks really like students. So students, maybe in college, came out with a capstone senior final project or whatever, um, and it's actually really, really cool. So they were able to develop a wheelchair uh, that essentially doesn't use any hardware to make it you know motorized or anything like that it's all controlled by neural waves uh, i'm going to play just a, it's a 10 minute video definitely not going to play the whole 10 minutes so i'm just going to play like a little snippet of it so you guys can kind of hear uh how this all works out um and i'm gonna full screen it and make sure the volume's up here and i'm neurotech and this is milo our brain controlled wheelchair the wheelchair is operated entirely by EEG signal, meaning it doesn't require the use of hands or limbs. It relies on imagined movement. To turn left, you imagine moving your left hand, and to turn right, you imagine moving your right hand. It has to be accurate, maneuverable, and easy to use, and we did this all using an EEG headset that costs less than $500. Let's start at the beginning. On February 24th, we assembled our team. We created a pipeline starting with the brain and ending with the wheelchair itself. And this is how we did it. All right, so there it is. That's just a quick 30 seconds of that video. Like I said, it's 10 minutes long. You guys are very much more than welcome to go check out uh, the actual video. I will drop the link to the um, article here in the description of the video, of course, to let you guys have it. Not really much on here as far as like, you know, describing what's going on. It did say you can go to the CBC website and kind of get a more in-depth feel for what the, what the uh, crew is, has been up to now lately. But if you want to learn more about how all of this works, again, just go to this video here. It's just a quick YouTube video um, that you can kind of see more about it. Uh, but in my opinion, and I always give you guys my opinion on things like this. Uh, I think this is actually really, really cool. The um, community for like disabled people, um, they end up losing out on a real aspect of life uh, after anything tragic happens to them. That's one of the biggest things that I fear um, makes an impact on them is that, you know, they want to be normal and doing something like this actually kind of allows them to be normal. Um, because right now that's how we that's how we live. We think to walk so we walk. We think to move our hands so we move our hands. We think to you know open our eyes and wake up every day and that's you know that's what we do. The, the body just automatically uh, has those motor functions and uh, once you become disabled for whatever reason, uh, God forbid, you kind of lose all of that and you're left to uh, relying on a machine, some sort of technology to, uh, bring you back into that sense of normalcy and this is actually one of the ways that actually helps to do that by allowing you to just say hey I want to go straight and then you move straight or I want to turn left and then you move left um, 
So in my opinion, it kind of helps in that aspect, uh, which is a very, 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 very good thing. Uh, I mean, because just imagine being like 16 years old, just getting, you know, your driver's license and getting into a tragic car accident. You can't walk until, I mean, for the rest of your life until, you know, you know, 80, 90, 100 years old, you may pass away or something like that. That's 80 whole years of you missing out on just being able to walk. So, um, yeah, anything to give people back that uh, that their life back, I would say, is, is a win win in my opinion. Uh, just like in this next article that I have here is a guy who was a NASCAR driver. Uh, then I guess he became the owner of the NASCAR team, but he ended up getting out of NASCAR because he got into a car accident. You know, I, I believe it's actually on the tracks and uh, he was paralyzed. He was paralyzed from the neck down or shoulders down. Uh, he was a quadriplegic and they were able to actually um, make or develop some sort of technology for him to be able to get back into uh, the races and stuff like that. I don't think he actually races professionally, uh, but he is back behind the wheel of a car and driving like normal. Uh, so I'm going to jump over here to the video now. Well, with the help of some impressive technology, a former ND car driver is able to race again despite being paralyzed from the neck down. Riley Carlson has the details on his latest laps in southern England. Getting back on the racetrack has been a long road for IndyCar driver Sam Schmidt. Paralyzed from the neck down in a crash 21 years ago, just getting into a car is a mammoth effort. Driving one himself without use of his arms or legs takes a bit of science. The fact that I'm steering it, I'm using the brake and the gas, and going as fast as I want is you know, exhilarating. In 2013, Schmidt began working with engineers from tech company Aero Electronics to build a car he could drive. He showed off the latest version of the semi-autonomous mobility, or SAM car, in southern England. Those cameras in the dashboard pick up his head motions to steer from infrared sensors in his helmet. He brakes and accelerates by inhaling and exhaling into a pressure sensor. What I didn't anticipate was this overwhelming feeling of normal fee because I was in control. Schmidt says the technology keeps getting better and expects it will change lives beyond the racetrack. You can drive a harvester, you can you know, drive a train, you can drive a forklift or a crane. Breaking down more barriers with every lap. Riley Carlson, CBS News, London. Schmidt has a co-driver with him whose hands hover over the wheel to take control in an emergency, but he has still managed to navigate a number of racetracks in the U.S. and drive his wife on a date. Now that is just amazing to me, uh, especially the last part about driving his wife out on a date. I mean, uh, for a man, you know, being able to protect and provide is actually, you know, like a big thing. And, you know, once you, I didn't even think about that. Once you become paralyzed, you know, you, 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 you can't even do that. I mean, um, so I could only imagine how he felt at that time. And then, like I said, 21 years later, uh, he's back on it, you know, being able to, um, to do that. That's, that's actually really amazing. Uh, and as you can see, I didn't even, you know, think about it, but in the video, uh, he said the most exhilarating part of him getting behind the wheel again uh, is feeling that sense of normalcy, feeling that sense of uh, being able to control the car by himself. Um, I think they said he had to breathe out to basically press on the gas, uh, breathe in to um, to brake, uh, move his head left and right to, to steer and everything. Uh, I did see another video, though, where he did like a burnout. <laughs> so where you have to like hold the brake and, and you know, um, press on the gas at the same time kind of thing. So. I'm assuming he just breathe in <laughs> fastly and breathe out fastly or something like that. Uh, or maybe the uh, his, his person that was driving with him was kind of helping him control that because they, they do got a steering wheel on their side as well. But um, yeah, that was, that's interesting. That's interesting for sure. Uh, but it's just really good to see him back on the road, uh, back behind the wheel doing what he loves. Like I said, he, he's been out of it. I don't want to say he's been out of it 21 years, but... Uh, at least a good 15, probably 20 years he's been out while the technology was kind of being developed. And then uh, uh, now he's back into it. So it's amazing. 
All right, and so for the next thing that we have here is music and how does music affect your brain? Uh, every imaginable way, apparently. So there's another video here. This video is actually longer than the first video, 12 minutes and two seconds. Uh, I am not gonna go ahead and play this video again. I like to keep this um, episode short and sweet, just kind of giving you the tidbits uh, and my quick rundown of all of these different articles and you know, allowing you guys to kind of pique your interest a little bit further uh, as you so please. Uh, but I will kind of jump in and you know, mention a few things here because I think they describe what's in the video but not actually in depth. So uh, one thing is, so I guess a guy, he was kind of, you know, trying to figure out how does music affect the brain and um, they went into USC's Brain and Creativity Institute. Um, and I guess he went into his own personal MRI to see how his brain responded to musical cues uh, and how his body did as well. Uh, but then he talked to researchers, researchers who have uh, been studying, uh, learning music and stuff like that and how it can help kids become better problem solvers. Um, and to author Dan Levton, uh, who helped break down the entire brain gets involved when you hear music. Uh, I did watch, I think a I forget if I watched the whole entire 12 minute video. I did watch the majority of it though. Um, and it was kind of interesting because we have like these children who are like excellent violinist and, and cellist and stuff like that, piano players. Um, and you just kind of wonder like how exactly do they get that way? Uh, music really has a way of attacking the brain and, and tapping into that, you know, creativity sector. Um, uh, whether it's, I think it's the, I think it's the right brain that has, that deals with the creativity side of things. But, um, um, so from there we dove into music's potential as a therapeutic tool, something Gabriel Giffords can attest to when the one time Congresswoman was shot in 2011, her brain injuries led to aphasia, a neurological condition that affects the speech through the use of treatments that include melodic intonation therapy Music helped retrain her brain's pathways to access language again. Um, I compare it to being in traffic. Uh, music is basically like taking a feeder road to the new destination. Um, so it looks like, and this is you know completely 100% true, um, again, left brain, right brain, the part of the brain that actually controls speech was basically blocked off or you know deadlocked in traffic um, due to whatever. And so music actually allowed this person, I, again, I remember watching this in the video, uh, the way she said it was music actually allowed her um, to bypass or detour um, that part of the brain that accesses speech. But once you go into the other side where access is like, you know, I guess creativity or music or whatever, uh, the brain was able to remember that. So she was actually able to sing words that she was not able to say out loud just without singing it. So she had to like sing everything she said pretty much um, just because of the, the way her brain actually worked out with it, uh, which is amazing in my opinion. Uh, the next thing, so they went to, uh, but singing or playing something you know is different from composing on the fly. What about uh, improvis improvisation and creativity? So we linked up with Xavier Defropolis, um, who is also known as a two-time Grammy winner Fantastic Negrito at UCSF. He went into an fMRI machine as well, though he brought a plastic keyboard so he could riff, all, riff along and sing to a backing track. Um, neuroscientist Charles Lim, who studies musical creativity, helped take us through the results and explain why the prefrontal cortex shuts down during improvisation uh, it's not just something that happens in clubs and jazz bars. Uh, it's actually maybe the most fundamental form of what it means to be human to come up with a new idea. Um, so yeah, so I guess this guy, he actually went inside a MRI machine and started playing the piano with just like brand new music, basically on the fly. Um, not just something that he already knew the words or the, the song of or the keys or something like that trying to figure out, all right, how does the brain work when it has to come up with something else new? When it has to work when it's come up with some sort of creativity? Um, and that's, to me, where real genius realize. Um, 
And there are a couple of books and videos here that they mention as well. So Matthew Sachs research on music and frission, uh, Asal Habibi music training and child development, a review of recent findings from a longitudinal study, Daniel Levitin's research on music and brains, inter internal opioid system and music on the stress. Uh, Daniel Levitin, again, his book on This Is Your Brain on Music, Charles Lim, Your Brain on Improv. It's a TED Talk, which I'm actually probably going to watch that. I love TED Talks. And Neural Substrates, a uh, Spontaneous Musical Performance, an FMRI Study of Jazz Improvisation. Uh, and then lastly, ABC News Report on <laughs> Gabriel Gifford's Music Therapy. Um, ABC News is kind of threw me off there, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so definitely check out those resources. Definitely check out this video that they have up here at the top. Um, if you got an extra 12 minutes to spare and you're interested in how music kind of affects the brain, uh, that'll be a good one to watch. And then lastly, the one that we have here is going to be Apple and their new AR slash MR slash VR, I would say, headset um, will be the biggest thing since the iPhone. So in case you don't know, AR stands for augmented reality, VR stands for virtual reality, MR just stands for mixed reality, which is a mixture of both AR and VR kind of mashed up together. So taking your virtual world, um, applying it to your augmented world, and then vice versa, essentially. Um, but yeah, so again, Apple, major company, um, they came out with the... I don't want to call them MacBooks, but the you know the Apple computers back in the day would have the colorful backs. They were like super huge or whatever. Um, that was a real pivotal moment in tech industry. Uh, another pivotal moment was when the iPod came out. Uh, another pivotal moment was when the iPhone came out. Um, and you know Apple has been just back to back to back had lots of technology go behind their uh, uh, devices and stuff like that. So now we have this AR, MR, VR headset, and I I, I completely 100% agree with this. Um, uh, by Chris Smith on August 8th, I guess a gentleman called QO, he is a, res uh, what is he, analyst. So a well-known analyst, Ming-Chi QO, uh, in issued a new note to clients explaining the challenges and expectations of Apple's upcoming V. R and AR device. QO maintained his earlier prediction that the MR device will get an early two, January 2023 launch. He also said that the AR MR headset will be Apple's most revolutionary device, revolutionary device after the iPhone. Um, and then, man, you gotta wonder, like, all right, now that we're here, where, what could be next? Like, you know, I don't think many people ever saw a VR become what it is today when the iPhone was just just coming out um, heck when the when the computers were coming out I don't even think people saw that the iPhone is being the next big thing so it's like where where in the next 10 15 20 years will Apple be what new thing will be coming out um, but it looks like one major thing that this uh, gentleman mr. QO is saying that the devices are Expected to cost two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars, uh, and that's going to be a major downfall on their part because right now the Facebook slash Meta Oculus is well, it was going for about three hundred dollars until they uh, increased the price a hundred dollars. Uh, I did a show on that last week, um, so now it's about you know four hundred bucks or whatever for one of those. But again, that's <laughs> that's five times cheaper than the Apple one is expected to come out as. So, um, and I'm assuming this analyst here, he knows what he's talking about. He's been uh, right on a lot of things before in the past. So even if it's not $2,000, anything over $1,000 is kind of like out of reach for a lot of um, uh, middle class working, you know, Americans and stuff like that. So we will see how that all plays out. But that's one thing that's going to be uh, impacting sales, as he says, uh, in that case, um, uh, their main focus is going to be for those devices are, uh, the hardware specifications, the software services, and also the development ecosystem. 
Um, so for all the development developers out there that are looking to develop, you know, AR, VR uh, apps and stuff like that, definitely get stay tuned for what uh, Apple has to uh, has to come here. Uh, of course, over the next few years, the price will drop. I mean, that's that's kind of with everything. Um, I'm not sure how quickly that'll happen, but you know, it'll get there. Um, oh yeah, eye tracking technology that's going to be huge. Uh, this is most appealing for the headset, and it's more sophisticated than anything offered by comparable devices. Furthermore, he signals other key details of the AR and MR headset that investors should be aware of. The list includes displaying for a great immersive experience, processors, optical cameras, and flex boards. Uh, moreover, the device has to be, oh, okay. Uh, moreover, the device has to be comfortable for users. It has a dissipate, it has to dissipate heat without impacting comfort or high speed computing. The parts that make the possible, that make that possible should also be of interest to the investors. Um, and it's funny that he keeps calling them investors. Cause I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's true. That's, you're really essentially investing in this, uh, company's new product. Um, what do you get in return? I, I can't see anything that you end up getting in return. Uh, I haven't gotten anything in return from meta or Facebook or for my, uh, Oculus quest Two. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're still putting money towards them to develop more of this technology to provide us more stuff. Um, that's an, all in their R and D department, uh, their QA department, uh, engineering department and stuff like that. So I would say it is an investment, but don't, don't hold your breath on getting a, a major return or anything like that. Um, so yeah, let me grab my ring light here and oh man it's bright um switch back over and uh yeah so that's all i have for you guys here today i definitely appreciate your time uh even with these uh minor technical difficulties i hope you still enjoyed the show um let me know in the comments how you guys feel about any of this new technology what you guys think of it and stuff like that um, drop me a line on any of my social media channels that uh, everything's going to be listed in the description for this video, uh, and check out all the links for the description of this video as well. Um, and yeah, without, uh, without there any further ado, again, I appreciate everyone's time and you guys have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.